Good evening and welcome. My name is Jerry McDermott. I'm the Media and Communications Manager here at Fingal County Council. And this is our second webinar as part of the consultation process that will play an important part in the creation of the Fingal Development Plan from for 2023 to 2029. On Tuesday night, we discussed people and place, and tonight we'll be looking at heritage and green infrastructure. Just over a month ago, on March the 12th, the development plan process began with the publication of a strategic issues paper. The purpose of this document is to stimulate debate and generate feedback from the public and stakeholders on what they think we should be doing to make Fingal a great place to live, work, visit and do business in. It marked the start of a two year process that will end in March 2023 with the adoption of the six year development plan by the elected members of Fingal County Council. Along the way, there will be three opportunities for the public and stakeholders to participate in the development plan process, and we are taking submissions on the strategic issues paper at the moment. The deadline for receipt of submissions is May 12th, and they can be uploaded onto the Fingal County Council consultation portal, which can be found at www.consult.fingal.ie. And if you are making a submission, please remember two things. It should be strategic in nature, and it should not be a zoning request, as zoning requests will not be considered at this time. There are for, further information on the development plan process is available on our website, which is fingal.ie forward slash development plan. The strategic issues paper contains seven key themes, and this is one of four webinars which will give you some background into these issues and an opportunity to pose questions about them. Tonight, as I've said already, we are discussing heritage and green infrastructure, which in, will include coastal management. And we will have two presentations followed by a question and answer session. If you want to ask a question or make a comment, please use the question and answer facility, which you should find in the top right hand corner of your screen. Before we commence our presentation, let me give you a few facts and figures about Fingal's heritage and green infrastructure. There are currently 1,151 known sites on the sites and monuments record that encompass the story of the people of Fingal. These range from churches and castles to Martello towers and windmills, and also include mounds, subsurface sites, graveyards and burials, mill races and shipwrecks. Fingal County Council currently has 795 structures listed on its record of protected structures, also known as RPS, and has 32 architectural conservation areas. Green infrastructure, which is also known as GI, can be understood as a planned network of interconnected natural areas such as parks, rivers and open spaces that help to conserve natural ecosystem functions. Green infrastructure planning results in environmental, economic and social benefits by providing nature based solutions to development objectives. Through development management over several decades, Fingal County Council has established 2000 hectares of public open space that are increasingly managed in a sustainable manner to ensure that future generations can enjoy the benefits of these amenities for recreation, health and well-being. The Fingal Ecological Network covers approximately 13,000 hectares, with much of the network located on lands in private ownership, and its delivery depends to a large extent on the goodwill and interest of local landlord, landowners, which, needless to say, we greatly appreciate. The Council also provides in excess of 800 public allotment places, which is the highest per capita in the country, and we also have 88 kilometres of coastline. Tonight, we have four guests with us. Roisin Burke is a senior planner with Fingal County Council and is overseeing the development plan process. Christine Baker is Fingal's heritage officer and we'll be, we'll be discussing Fingal's cultural heritage, which contributes to the attractive or special character of our towns, villages and countryside. She will also talk about our less tangible heritage, such as language, skills and place names. Kevin Halpenny is senior park superintendent in the planning and strategic infrastructure department. Kevin will discuss the Fingal approach to green infrastructure and will also deal with coastal management. Roshi, Christine and Kevin will also be joined for the question and answer session by Helena Bergen, our conservation officer, who will be able to take your questions on that aspect of heritage. Questions to Helena and our other panellists can be typed into the Q&A box and as many as possible will be facilitated. Those that are not answered will still be considered in the consultation process. 
Finally, if we do have any technical issues this evening, please bear with us and we will endeavour to resolve them as they arise. Before we go to tonight's presentations, I'd like to invite Senior Planner Roisin Burke to formally welcome you to tonight's event. Roisin. Thanks for that, Jerry. I want to begin by thanking you all for taking the time to be here this evening. These are challenging times and it's a lovely evening and we at Fingal appreciate you taking the time to participate in this process. This is your county and Fingal County Council wants everyone, youth groups, older citizens, businesses, local residents, organisations, community groups to have your say on the county's future. As Jerry outlined, this is the first stage in preparing the new Fingal Development Plan for 2023 to 2029. The preparation of a new development plan to guide the county's future development is one of the most important functions of the County Council. This plan will set out a shared vision to guide future development for the benefit of Fingal and all its citizens. This consultation has come at a time of unprecedented challenges for Fingal arising from the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, Brexit and climate change. The next Fingal Development Plan offers an opportunity to respond to these challenges and to build on the success of the significant investment and regeneration seen over the period of the current plan. The Council is committed to ensuring the efficient use of Fingal's land to deliver additional housing, integrated transport solutions, including enhanced walking and cycling facilities, community infrastructure and facilities, cultural and sports development, as well as sustainable economic growth. This webinar is focused on the themes of heritage and green infrastructure, and the purpose is to provide you with an overview of the theme, to hear about it, to ask questions and gather more information before you have your say and make your submission. We recognise the importance of identifying and protecting the heritage resource of the county. And this is reflected in the current development plans, aims, and in its policies, objectives and programmes. Equally, planning for green infrastructure results in a resilient urban landscape adapted for and reducing the negative effects of climate action. Thank you again for taking the time to join us this evening. And I'll pass you back to Jerry now to begin the presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Roisin. So it's time for our first presentation, which is from the Fingal Heritage Officer, Christine Baker, and it's about Fingal's cultural heritage. Hello, my name is Christine Baker and I'm Fingal's Heritage Officer. The theme is cultural heritage. Cultural heritage is a collective term which includes archaeological sites and monuments, architectural places and spaces, and intangible heritage such as language, traditional skills, rituals, folklore and place names. The distinctive heritage and collective memory of each locality or community are unique and an important foundation for sustainable development. This map shows the extent of some of Fingal's heritage assets, including archaeological sites, protected structures, archaeological con architectural conservation areas, historic gardens and domain landscapes, and our geological heritage sites. The National Monuments Act 1930 to 2014 provide for the protection of archaeological sites, monuments, artefacts and shipwrecks through the statutory instrument, the Record of, M of Monuments and Places or the RMP. The SMR, the Sites and Monuments <coughs> Record, feeds into the RMP. It records sites such as churches and castles, martello towers and windmills, mounds, subsurface sites, graveyards and burials, mill races and holy wells and can be added to when sites are discovered on aerial photographs of true development. There are currently 1,151 known sites on the SMR. Approximately 40% of the recorded archaeological sites within Fingal are subsurface. Therefore, any development has the potential to uncover previously unknown archaeological sites, such as this one in the open space of Rose Park in Balrathby. Our architectural heritage is primarily protected under the Planning and Development Act 2000 as amended, in particular part four. There are two principal mechanisms within this legislation for the protection of these assets. The record of protected structures and the architectural conservation areas. A protected structure is a structure or part of a structure that is of significance under one or more of the following eight criteria of special interest. Architectural, archaeological, artistic, cultural, historical, scientific, social 
and technical. The record of protected structures is the list of all the designated structures. There are, there are currently 795 protected structures within Fingal. A review of the RPS will be undertaken in tandem with the development plan process. Places, areas, groups of structures or townscapes of special interest can be protected by being designated as architectural conservation areas, ACAs. ACA designation places a level of protection on the exterior of buildings of merit and controls on how a new build addresses the streetscape. It does not prevent new development or changes occurring within the area, but guides new work to be appropriate and sympathetic to the special character. There are currently 32 ACAs in Fingal. Heritage sites can have more than one designation. Take, for instance, the Holy Well in Wadud. It's a recorded monument, a protected structure, and a county geological heritage site. Designated landscapes are gardens, parklands, woodland estates, and public parks that were deliberately laid out for artistic effect using both natural and built features. They were in Fingal, the primarily um, domains are estate lands, which were originally privately owned, for example, Malahide Castle Domain, Rushrosstown Castle Domain, Newbridge House Domain. Another important element, traditional vernacular buildings and historic street furniture, such as limestone or granite curbs, cobblestones, cast iron, post box, water pumps, milestones and street lightning contribute positively to the rural landscape as well as to the historic villages and towns of Fingal, establishing the distinctive character of a particular area. We also have industrial heritage, from manufacturing to transport, our maritime heritage, which includes not only shipwrecks, but harbours, piers and quays, as well as more intangible heritage, such as field names and, and traditions associated with holy wells. Some of the key issues that we've identified, the impact of climate change. Changing climatic processes will have a detrimental and differing effects on Fingal's archaeological resource, historic building stock and maritime heritage. Fingal County Council is currently undertaking a, fin a cultural heritage and climate change risk assessment that will look at the hazards of climate change and the vulnerability of our heritage assets. There will also be indirect impacts arising for our, our responses to climate change. The repairs, such as the repair cycle on the built heritage over time, is likely to become shorter. More intensive farming will impact on subsurface archaeological sites, and protection measures may inadvertently have a detrimental, detrimental impact on the heritage resource. The development plan process provides an opportunity to ensure that measures such as energy retrofitting of historic buildings stop damage the historic fabric of materials. Another key issue, balancing development pressures with the protection of Fingal's heritage resource for future generations. Archaeology is linked with real life, land development, urban planning, transport infrastructure, environmental protection and agriculture, all can have a direct impact on our archaeological heritage. How can we best plan, balance the need for new development with the protection and enhancement of our heritage resource? Likewise, town and village centres are historic places with their own distinct identities. Sustaining the, these is a complex process that in many cases involves the conservation and reuse of existing buildings, the care of public spaces, the provision of community facilities, and the communication and interpretation of what makes the place interesting and unique. What policies and incentives can encourage heritage regeneration with the retention or reuse of traditional and historic buildings? Engagement with Fingal's heritage resource. Studies have found that engagement with heritage can contribute to social cohesion, positive interactions and self-esteem. Heritage is good for us. Intangible heritage plays an important role in Fingal's identity and, allowing new communities, and allows new communities to connect. Cultural heritage also has a high value in underpinning the tourism industry. It is important to ensure widespread engagement with the heritage resource. How can we widen heritage engagement, physical, practical and virtual, with disparate audiences and new communities? Our heritage 
builds communities, underpins tourism and growth and is central to our identity. How can we better promote our heritage resource for the benefit of local communities? And how can technology help to highlight the heritage resource for a tourist audience? <clears throat> Are there any individual buildings or groups of buildings, industrial heritage sites and features that should be added to the record of protected structures or designated as architectural conservation areas? Can you explain why these why you believe these buildings, sites or areas are of significance. Our cultural heritage has a powerful contribution to make to the quality of life, of life of today's citizens in terms of social inclusion, environmental protection and sustainable development. We look forward to your submissions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Christine, and there's certainly plenty of food for thought there. If you have a question for Christine, please type it into the Q&A box and send it on to us. Uh, we plan to spend around 30 minutes answering your questions, and if your question doesn't feature, don't worry, it will be passed on to the development plan team for consideration. Now, our second presentation this evening is from Kevin Halpenny, Senior Parks and Landscape Officer here at Fingal County Council. He's going to talk about the Fingal approach to green infrastructure and also coastal management. My name is Kevin Halpney. I'm the Senior Parks and Landscape Officer with Fingal County Council. My presentation today is on planning for green infrastructure and natural heritage in the context of the Fingal Development Plan. So what is green infrastructure? Green infrastructure can be understood as a planned and multifunctional network of interconnected natural areas, such as parks, rivers, and open spaces that help conserve natural ecosystem functions. Green infrastructure planning results in environmental, economic, and social benefits for, by providing nature-based and uh, resilient solutions to development objectives. And the current Fingal Development Plan emphasises the benefits of green infrastructure planning. And planning for green infrastructure results in resilient urban landscapes. These landscapes are adapted for and able to withstand the negative effects of climate change. This slide shows an overall strategic green infrastructure plan for the town of Soares, where a network of parks and green infrastructure uh, spaces provides a range of environmental benefits. So some examples of green infrastructure. Well, woodland planting along a motorway is a good example of the multifunctional nature of green infrastructure. The planting belts along this road not only screen the traffic from neighbouring areas, but also remove dust and other particles of pollution and absorb greenhouse gases such as CO2. Planting also prevents erosion and embankments and importantly, provides a habitat for a wide range of birds, animals and insects. Parks and open spaces are also important elements of green infrastructure. Through the planning process over several decades, Fingal County Council has established over 2,000 hectares or 5,000 acres of public open space that are increasingly managed in a sustainable manner to ensure that future generations can enjoy the benefits of these amenities for recreation, health, and well being. Parks incorporate significant elements of urban green infrastructure, include, including greenways for sustainable transport, sports facilities for active recreation, wetlands, which prevent flooding, species rich wildflower meadows and woodlands, which provide important reserves for biodiversity. On a smaller local scale, Street trees can also form an important part of our green infrastructure. 
For instance, 100 mature trees can capture over 1 million litres of rainwater each year, preventing serious problems with runoff and flooding. Roadside planting also in, is seen to encourage careful driving and uh, reduces the incidence of speed. A single mature tree uh, can absorb over 20 kilos of carbon from the atmosphere every year. Biodiversity uh, itself is an important element of green infrastructure and protecting biodiversity and natural heritage is a key consideration relating to green infrastructure planning. Fingal has a rich biodiversity resource with its coast, countryside and urban centres. The value of biodiversity extends from the health benefits to be gained from contact with nature to the economic gains for local businesses associated with food production and outdoor pursuits. Fingal's approach to biodiversity, the ecological network, is made up of core nature conservation areas, buffer zones and nature development areas. Fingal contains a wealth, a wealth of natural heritage. But the patterns of loss of this heritage mirrors the global pattern as our local habitats are lost and species numbers have declined. The challenge through the development plan is to develop the county in a way which maintains and enhances biodiversity for future generations. This slide illustrates some of the important questions for consideration under the theme of green infrastructure and natural heritage in the context of the new development plan. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, so if you have any questions for Kevin or any of our panelists, please type them into the Q&A box and we'll try to get through as many of them as we can between now and eight o'clock. So let's get our panelists to switch on their microphones and we'll go to the first question this evening. And it's for Helena Bergen, who is our conservation officer. And Helena, we have a question here uh, from one of our viewers who wants to know, how do uh, they find out what buildings are already protected structures and also where architectural uh, convention areas can be found? Hi, um, so yes, yeah, so if you want to locate the existing protected structures, they're listed in Appendix 2 of the current development plan. They're also then shown on the development plan maps by yellow circular icons, and the number in that yellow circle refers to Appendix 2, so the numbers will link up together. The architectural conservation areas are also listed in the development plan. They're within Chapter 10. If you go to Table 10.1, I think, within that you'll get a list. It's most of the towns and villages some of the historic domains and some street capes, escapes and um, <coughs> vernacular groups of buildings. So they're the areas to locate them. OK, thank you, uh, Helena. Uh, Christine, I have one for you. Um, one viewer wants to know, how can the development plan protect heritage? Um, so that's a great question. Um, until I started working in the council, I don't think I made the, the link between the development plan and heritage protection myself. Um, the current, if you look at the current development plan, there are objectives that feed into the development management process. So the planners will give consideration to these when they're applying planning conditions. So things like sites of a certain scale requiring an archaeological impact assessment. Then there are objectives that relate to raising awareness and the promotion of the heritage resource um, and dissemination of knowledge, and they translate into talks and exhibitions and publications. And likewise, we have um, projects that feed into the implementation of the development plan projects. So say something like the Fingal Field Names Project um, helps with the preservation of our intangible heritage but also feeds into um, the plan objectives by relating, um, we could use those field names to help with the naming of developments, for instance. So we preserve the names and get to use them again in, with development. Okay. okay. And I suppose that, 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 that as you say, using the, the local history, the local field names for estates and, and that sort of thing, that really is preserving the culture, isn't it? Uh, exactly. And that, that project is volunteer led, it's community led. So we're capturing all that information that's out in the community um, that will be lost forever if we don't do it now. So yeah, 
and re reusing and upcycling. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Never waste a good name, never mind a good idea. Um, Kevin, I have one here for you. Um, one of our viewers wants to know, are there any measures underway to ensure coastal management and coastal protection? Yeah, thanks, Jerry. And uh, in purely in statutory terms, the council's remit, like every other local local authority, in relation to coastal change or uh, coastal management, is quite limited and really relates to the protection of coastal infrastructure, public infrastructure. In response to those that limited remit, Fingal in 2016 formed the Fingal Coastal Liaison Group, which is a forum for local communities in Fingal, local coastal communities. And we have representatives on that liaison group who work with the council uh, and through which the council acts as a, as a, as a, a conduit to access uh, a means of addressing uh, issues around coastal change and and concerns that those communities have. So we are working through the Coastal Liaison Group with a number of communities that have that concern. Uh, and there's a well publicised situation in the Rogerstown Outer Estuary, which affects Rush and Port Ran, where we're uh, helping to manage coastal change in consultation with the local community. And we see this a, as a really good uh, structure and a really good uh, forum uh, to help communities uh, with the issue, the very difficult issue of coastal change, coastal management and coastal protection. OK, thank you, Kevin. Um, and don't forget, if you've got any questions for any of our panellists, uh, please use the Q&A box uh, in the top right hand corner of your screen and send them on to us and we'll try and get through as many as we can between now and eight o'clock. Now, Helena, I have another question for you. Um, somebody wants to know, how do we protect the domains from in in inappropriate development? So an, a number of the large, or I think nearly all of the large um, domains, which are the you know the large county or county estates, they are now architectural conservation areas, and so that would cover or give some protection to the buildings within it and the designed features within the lands. Um, so a lot of those are also within Fingal County Council's ownership. That is as a lovely legacy of the parks. Uh, superintendents uh, and so we have uh, a number of those that you know are there for the uh, the the residents of Fingal to enjoy those that are in private ownership again a number of the large ones are conservation areas and we would hope that would help um with you know kind of making sure if there is proposals for development that it is uh, appropriate there are objectives in the development plan and it is uh, recommended or it's sought for that there is appraisals done uh, on the impacts on design land, landscape of any proposed development so that we would use those objectives in the development plan. And that's why the development plan is so important that it contains objectives that help us in the assessment of development proposals. Thank you, um, Helena. Christine, um, how do we promote hidden heritage and in particular uh, bringing the stories of smaller towns and villages to our tourists, for example? Um, I think that's something I'd love to get some submissions on actually. Um, we recently um, developed some guidance for heritage signage and heritage trails, but um, we also want to move away from that and to bring things to um, a wider audience. So I would recommend heritage audits and interpretation plans in terms of that a community would assess what's their well, archaeological from natural heritage point of view and come up with a plan that works on several levels, whether it's through social media, whether it's through videos, whether it's through all that digital area um, and that these are, we can reach as wide an audience as possible. And, and would there be any examples out there that, that communities could look at? Like, is, is there good examples within Fingal of good practice in that area? Um, well, I'd suggest we'll, we'll read the guidance. <laughs> it's currently be being translated into um, Irish at the moment um, ahead of publication. Yeah. Um, I would also recommend looking at Fingal.ie, the heritage and conservation section of our website. There's a lot of information there um, from videos produced by our digital officer, um, from locals, from um, 
reports that can be downloaded about your local area that can be used as a baseline for interpretation. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely have a look at that. Yeah, so there's definitely plenty out there, and I suppose you're only limited by your imagination in terms of conveying the, the work. That's it, that. and you know, I think everybody's connected to their own particular areas, especially during the last year, uh, and want to impart, impart that to new audiences. So, um, any thoughts on that would be most welcome. Okay, thank you, Christine. Um, continue to send in your questions uh, use the Q&A box in the, in the top uh, right hand corner. And as I said, we're going to try and get through as many of them as we can between now and eight o'clock. Kevin, uh, one for you. Um, what's the council's position in relation to the provision of playgrounds in Fingal? Well, up until now, uh, Jerry, there's been three main ways in which the council delivers play facilities. Number one is to the planning process where we require uh, developers uh, who are applying for uh, a planning permission to provide play facilities within new residential development. Then where we have significant uh, um, demand from local communities to retrospectively provide play facilities, we do that through our capital program. And then also when we're developing new parks ourselves, uh, we typically provide play facilities within those. Now, in relation to this development plan and in, in uh, preparation for this de development plan, we are establishing a new play policy for Fingal. So at the February uh, Strategic Policy com uh, Committee, we presented a, sp a space for play, a, a play policy for Fingal. And that will go through non-statutory cons consultation this year with a view to uh, the policy being adopted, the, play, the new play policy being adopted in, an, in advance of the, uh, of the development plan and for inclusion in that development plan. So that will focus on levels of accessibility, on defining levels of accessibility for play facilities and widening the range of play facilities uh, available to citizens uh, and children in the thing, in, the, in, in Fingal. And I suppose, Kevin, that uh, playgrounds are, are a very, very important part of community infrastructure. It's increasingly understood that, that the ability for children to play in a very free way uh, and not in, the, in a very unstructured way is fundamental to the development of, of, your, of, of children, uh, early development of children. There's a, a really good in, uh, knowledge and in, increasing evidence base around that. And that's why uh, having a defined a policy around play is so, is so fundamentally important. And I suppose too, you, you're not just talking when you talk about playgrounds. It's it's not just the slides and the swings. No. And it's if there's other aspects well, to it as well. Absolutely, the play policy will uh, will work to integrate play into children's everyday experience, going to and from school, uh, at, at a very uh, sort of local level to their uh, to where they live. So we we probably move away from this uh, uh, this very uh, sort of structured view of destina just destination playgrounds. We want to integrate play into design of our open space. So it's much more part of everyday existence and experience for children. And I suppose much more natural as well. Absolutely. And there's a lot of, cap we have a lot of capacity in Fingal for that because we have a good network of residential open space that can be adapted for more informal play. OK, thank you, Kevin. Um, Roisin Burke, if I, if I can turn to you, we have a question. Um, if we want to have a particular green area left untouched, should this be specified in a submission at this stage? I suppose at this stage of the development plan process, we are seeking submissions on strategic issues, but something like that could be framed within the context of the of the space providing an important function for the neighbourhood of the community. It would be important that the person does it request a rezoning at this point. We cannot consider them at this stage, but I think where someone's talking about their local area and they're talking about how a green space provides an important function, whether that's for a play area, a kickabout area, passive open space or more active open space, we'd very much like to hear that. And I think I mentioned it in the introduction that at this stage we're looking for submissions that are strategic in nature. So really you want people to put their thinking caps on and, and come up with ideas, isn't it? 
Absolutely. So, you know, what I would be considering at this stage is take the area you're from and have a look at it in the as a, in its entirety. So look at what functions well, whether you have enough green spaces, areas such as the one the person has mentioned in the question, if you have enough shops, if you have enough uh, other sporting facilities and talk about the area as a whole rather than specific um, pockets of that area. And I, and I think too, it's it's a great opportunity for people to 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 really get in on the development plan process at the very beginning and and get the ideas that could possibly end up in the the draft development plan. Absolutely, at this stage we're open to everything. So we're reviewing the existing policies and trying to work out what has worked well and what has not. And we're also trying to draft now new policies that are aspirational in nature and also ones that are implementable. So we would see the development plan as the first stage when we have a specific policy to provide some of the play areas, some green areas or other facilities, then it's very much as jumping off point for us to seek funding, seek plan information or consent or whatever that that may be to provide those facilities down the line. So it's important that people start to think now, what do they want? What do they need? What works well? What doesn't in their area? Any plan and application that comes in following the adoption of this development plan is assessed against the policies and objectives of this plan. So it's important that we get these right now. Okay, thank you, Rosie. Uh, Kevin, can I come back to you? Uh, we have a question in here from, from one of our viewers who wants to know, how do we preserve mature trees? Uh, can we even move them to different locations? They, they say that it seems to be done successfully in other countries where development uh, impinges on mature trees. Yes, uh, and and uh, thankfully the technology around moving trees is actually developing quite well. We know that, uh, and I have uh, been involved in a few projects myself where we have successfully moved mature uh, or semi-mature trees. I wouldn't go as far as saying mature trees, but trees typically of maybe 15 years old or 15 years post planting up to that sort of uh, period of time um, are, are are capable of being moved successfully and uh, we're increasingly working with our colleagues uh, in roads engineers and and our planning colleagues and that to look at sites in advance of development to see are there opportunities uh, not to just clear fell the the trees that that need to be removed for for uh, development purpose but to look at opportunities for uh, relocating trees. And there's a uh, there's a whole technique around that in, tree, in terms of preparing the trees, possibly a season before they're moved and then having a site prepared to move the trees into. But that it is absolutely possible and it is an increasing feature and will be an increasing feature of what how we respond to man uh, tree management on our sites. And that's referenced also in our Forest of Fingal, our new uh, tree strategy, which uh, we expect will be approved this year also in advance of the development plan. And, and trees are very important in Fingal. Like I think I read somewhere that we've over 70,000 trees that Fingal County Council itself is responsible for. They, they're just our street trees, uh, Jerry. We have a similar, possibly a fair bit more than that actually in our parks and open spaces. And uh, as I said in, in my introductory presentation, they uh, have a huge, they've shown now there's, it's, it's, uh, there's evidence, to, to significant body of evidence to show the level of health and well-being benefits that trees uh, provide in streets and in open spaces and parks uh, and, and even uh, down to the level of psychological benefit. So uh, we need to protect our trees and we need to uh, plan and make provision for trees in, in our development. Uh, uh, in our development process, they need to be central. That the trees need to be central to that, and um, and it's a very good question about uh, being able to um, use mature trees or semi-mature trees and respond to them as opposed to just straight away thinking you know they have to be removed. But they, uh, as I say. Uh, we have very strong provision for uh, tree management, uh, tree protection and tree planting uh, incorporated into our uh, uh, tree strategy for Fengal. OK, thank you, Kevin. Um, Helena Bergen, if I can turn to you, uh, we have another question for you. And um, one of our viewers wants to know is how, how does someone recommend a building to be added to the record of protected structures? 
So the, uh, during this process, there's a, the possibility of doing it that you make a submission as part of the development plan um, and that you write out uh, why you feel the building is protected, not just the address. It would help a huge amount in the assessment process if the individual could, can set out why they believe it to be of special significance. So the eight areas again are architectural, archaeological, historical, cultural, technical, scientific, social um, and um, historical, artistic. So they're, they're listed in the development plan if people can't remember that. There will also be the ability, I suppose, afterwards if you want to con contact me directly. So if you send an email um, to helena.bergen at fingal.ie, the assessment process will really be taking place um, in this summer that we would need to have the list and decided what we are putting forward to the record protected structures by October, November, so that it is in that first draft of the development plan. So um, asking people to set it out and set out as much information as possible to help me um, present that case to uh, the councillors uh, when it goes forward uh, as part of the development plan process. And Helena, are there any grants available to help maintain a, a protected structure? Like if I if I owned a protected structure, um, how can I, are there grants available and how would I apply for them if there are? Yeah, there's three schemes that I operate as the conservation officer. So two of them are national schemes and they have very specific closing dates, which is generally the 31st of January was a little extended this year because of COVID. And so that is called, or the two of them is the Built Heritage Investment Scheme. That's uh, medium scale projects and then the results of the Historic Structures Fund that is for larger projects. So the closing date has passed for 2021, but if anybody's thinking of doing works that to, um, to look for the advertisements for that, those schemes in November and December and think about the closing dates being in January. The other uh, third scheme that is operated is from Fingal County Council's own budgets. It is a very small grant. It's called the Stitch in Time Grant, and it is there to try and help with that routine maintenance so you don't get to the point uh, of needing maybe the larger works. Um, now that doesn't necessarily have a closing date, it depends on when the budget uh, runs out. Um, it's fully allocated at the moment. So, but if people want to contact me directly, if there's any way in any funding scheme that I can help them with, I will direct them to that. So again, come and contact me or talk to me. Yes, and that email address is helena.bergen at fingal.ie. Thank you, Helena. Kevin, can I come back to you? We're getting a lot of queries in here just looking at the Q&A board uh, about reducing grass cutting in open areas in order to encourage wildflowers to become established and to increase biodiversity. And um, so what they, um, some of the people uh, who are watching us want to know is, that, is there any chance of increasing the length of time between grass cutting or leaving uncut margins at the edges or and between groups of trees? Thanks, Jerry. Yes, well, in, in, with the soil types we have in Fingal and the climate we have in Fingal, uh, grass left uncut won't stay as wildflower meadow or, or, or grass even for very long. It will tend to become uh, a native woodland, which may be very attractive to, to have in certain areas and certainly there's justification for doing that in, in some some of our parks and some areas of our parks. But to actually to have wildflower meadows in, in, in and of itself entails a certain type of grass maintenance and, and essentially requires making hay. And I'm glad to say that in, in Fingal we have uh, in excess of 300 acres of wildflower meadow managed through the council and often in collaboration with uh, local farmers. And that's a very successful model, but it's predicated on having areas large enough to accommodate uh, haymaking equipment and all the rest of it. So in other smaller areas, what we're trying to do is introduce a, a range of uh, what we call a hierarchy of mowing uh, regimes that relate to the type of usage of that of, of that land. So you'll see in certain verges we've done mass bulb planting in uh, uh, grass verges. And the, the good thing about those is that they keep the, you know, keep a level of um, 
uh, color and uh, and uh, biodiversity and they make you know attractive for pollinators for a period of time in the spring and that uh, that allows the grass in among the bulbs to grow and uh, itself flower and provide a food source for insects and and other pollinators so uh, uh, very native sort of plants and then we would mow that typically later in the season so we get a, a, a and alongside that, we might have a, a short verge and then for kickabout areas and residential areas, we, we grow at a different regime and then sports areas, ag again, a different regime. So we're trying to match the, the maintenance regime with the usage pattern, while at the same time trying to encourage uh, increased, I suppose, awareness of and appreciation of the advantages of long grass. Uh, and uh, that's that's the way we're going. It's not a one size or one height of cut fits all. It's a, a dynamic thing and we certainly we try to respond to local demands and local community requirements uh, to the best of our ability. But ideally uh, we'd like to move towards more areas where we're able to produce hay and have a, a, a use for that because that's the best and most um, sustainable way of of uh, managing wildflower meadows is to make uh, is to make hay and have a use for that another opportunity we're looking at is using that hay as actually a source of uh, energy as a source of fuel and uh, we're looking at examples of that from other jurisdictions where it's in operation Right. Thanks, Kevin. Well, our next question is definitely one for our senior planner, Roisin Burke. Um, Roisin, one of our viewers wants to know, can decisions by on board Granola contravene development plan uh, policies? Um, in short, yes. The Planning Act does allow for the board to grant permission for a development which materially contravenes the development plan when national planning, planning policy takes place. So for people that are unaware, the development plan obviously has a number of policies which outlined how development should take place. Where an application comes in which is contrary to that, that's known as a material contravention. We would be unable to grant that as we must comply with our development plan policies. That decision could be appealed to a board planola and they have the power to consider the development in the context of national plan and policy and subsequently grant that permission. This really only happens where new national plan and policy has come into being after the adoption of the development plan and our development plan is somewhat or the national policy takes precedence. So it does happen on occasion and the Planning Act does allow for that. OK, thank you. Thanks for, for clearing that up. Um, Christine, if I can turn to you, you mentioned in your presentation climate uh, action and um, and climate, um, d d d the whole climate change problems. And uh, one of our viewers wants to know, what is the Council doing about climate action? In relation to heritage, obviously, yeah. the big question. Well, I suppose, yeah, <laughs> you're not the climate action officer. Uh, yeah. and, and, uh, we have, we have, I mean, as, as you probably know, we have the thing called Climate Change Action Plan um, and there are um, actions relating to heritage. And I suppose our primary focus that's underway at the minute is the Fingal Cultural Heritage and Climate Change Risk Assessment, which I mentioned in the presentation, um, probably could do with a catchier title, but it's basically about um, using GIS to analyse the vulnerability of all those heritage resources we were talking about, like the archaeological monuments and the protected structures and the historic gardens and the geological um, sites, um, to a range of the climate hazards, the main climate hazards, so different types of flooding, um, landslide and coastal erosion. Um, the results of that will inform our priorities for future works um, and for future projects. Um, this summer, um, we're hoping to develop a I, I'm hoping to develop a citizen science project to um, monitor and report changes in the conditions of these monuments that people have in their localities. So ask a members of the community to contribute to that. So um, keep you updated on that. <laughs> yes, and, and if anybody wants to know anything more about the Climate Action Plan 2019 to 2024, they can find it at the Fingal website, fingal.ie. And I think there's over 130 different actions within the climate change plan. So there is plenty going on in relation to, to climate action. Um, 
If we move on uh, with another question, this one is for Helena and uh, one of our viewers wants to know, how can the development plan improve the design of our streetscapes within our ACA areas? I'm not sure what ACA is, but perhaps you might explain that as well. Yeah, the, the ACA is the Architectural Conservation Areas. And so there are policies, again, kind of an objectives within the development plan in relation to development within that. Um, within our streetscape area, there's an awful lot of different sections of the council that have responsibility there. So there would be the planning department, the um, operations department, and sometimes the events uh, section as well. So it's something, you know, kind of I am looking for uh, people to uh, input in and give us suggestions. Um, there is the potential and there have been done for um, Malahide that there have been public realm strategies done in some of the areas and there is a conservation area in Malahide. Um, Balbregan has a rejuvenation plan and it also has a conservation area. So there's different mechanisms that can help guide and design um, how the public realm is dealt with. So that's the street furniture and the uh, kind of was leading on to its you know, shop fronts. So it's it's a, an area to be developed and to work in agreement with, um, but there are uh, guidance given within the county development plan. And um, there's a chapter on development management standards, and there is guidance within that on works and conservation areas. And part of that does look at works in public realm uh, areas. So there's there's always guidance and direction that we have, and that's what the development plan is is there to do. So if you have any suggestions to improve on that or to add to that, this is the um, this, was, this is the time of the, the this and the next um, development uh, uh, public uh, consultation to put those forward. Um, it's a little bit different, I suppose, with that I'm asking for people to make submissions on specific buildings for the record of protected structures, where everything at this stage is supposed to be more strategic. Um, <laughs> so it's just kind of a little bit uh, just kind of open at the moment. So. I think both through the consultation at this point and the second consultation, people can make those recommendations. OK, um, thank you, Helena. Uh, Kevin, I have a couple for you. Um, obviously, our, our chat about the trees uh, got a few people thinking and uh, we have a question in wondering if it's possible to get a preservation order on specific trees that have a very precise historical context. Uh, yes, Jerry. Uh, the answer to that is 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 correct. Is is in the positive uh, tree preservation order TPO. It's possible to have that. It's a planning process. It's, it is possible to have a TPO on an individual tree, uh, and in uh, in applying for a TPO. Uh, the applicant would need to demonstrate that the tree has a viability to it and demonstrate the uh, coherent reasons for its per, uh, future protection. But uh, we have three, uh, three tree pre preservation orders uh, in, in Fingal. Uh, there, I suppose we do other things through the development plan uh, and through our development management with a view to protecting our trees, but certainly uh, the TPO is an option if, if, if people want to go that direction. And the other question I have here in front of me uh, is wants to know, are Fingal County Council planning to open any new parks in the county? We have a good pipeline of new parks in Fingal, very significant new parks. Uh, just currently we have on public display or going through a statutory uh, consultation process, the Braemore Regional Park in Balbriggan. And we have three more weeks of that on public display and I'd urge people who are interested to go and look at that through our portal and they'll see the details of that new park. Uh, alongside that, uh, we have uh, the Rogerstown Park, which is a 50 hectare park located on the former Balili landfill. And we're working with specialist uh, uh, consultants, engineering and landscape consultants on a, uh, an exciting plan for that, which will, because it's a former landfill, will go through the EPA and then through onboard Planala for approval. And then alongside that later this year, we expect to lodge with on board Panola uh, a plan for the uh, development plan for the race course park in uh, which is located between Baldoyle and Port Marnock. It's the, it's the green belt uh, land between those two towns. Very significant, very important from a biodiversity, um, from uh, a, um, a recreational point of view. It's uh, we've already developed the first section of the coastal greenway through that park and the park as a whole will go through planning uh, later this year. Uh, and then uh, we're working on, uh, we just acquired a last piece of land for 
the Ward River Valley Regional Park, which is a really significant piece of green infrastructure illustrated in my, my presentation, uh, which uh, I suppose will act as a major um, piece of, of um, uh, infrastructure generally, but important green infrastructure for uh, the town of Swords. And uh, we're also working on plans for the Talca Valley and for Dunsink as well. And uh, we're sh just sh uh, shortly to complete the, re the restoration of the uh, Shackleton Gardens in Clonsilla. And we hope to open those, uh, those uh, restored gardens, uh, historic gardens to the public later this year also. OK, thank you, Kevin. Now, uh, we're just coming up towards the end of our programme, so I'm just going to squeeze in two final questions. Uh, the first one is to Helena. Helena, what type of characteristics might a property have to warrant? Ha sorry, what type of, type of characteristics might a property have to have to warrant inclusion on the RPS? Um, so I suppose it, it's that this is the special interest and it's looking at it. And a lot of the um, old the buildings that have been on the list for a good number of years since the 70s are those architectural, the important buildings that you would look at and kind of maybe most people would understand from an architectural historical point of view why they're important. So that would be Malahide Castle and you know the, the large country houses, but they can also be of technical significance that they're an unusual construction material, uh, material the first time, you know, maybe um, that steel framing was used. So there will be 20th century buildings that we have added in the last review of the development plan. Uh, sorry, the vast review of the record of protected structures. So it's 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 why it's of special interest. So it could be the um, the artistic elements could be that they're beautiful stained glass by a renowned artist, um, or that they are of social special social interest. Their historic coaching inns, the industrial heritage significance is something that we've also looked at recently as well. So we added a lot of the historic harbors because they were unusual engineering construction from their time. So there are differences in different ways in which a property might be uh, added to the record of protected structure. If people I suppose, want guidance on that, um, it, there's, there's a, a document that the government have done on architectural heritage protection guidelines for, prote for planning authorities. So it kind of gives you an idea of why those, uh, those reasons are there, or I can explain it if people want me to, to do it. So it's not just age related. Um, and that's also to say that not every old building merits protection either. So it is that there's special interest. That's the, the key term. And and just to reiterate, I suppose, um, briefly, is that this this is the period really for the recommendations of the record of protected structures. Um, once it goes on public display in February 2023, that it's, um, you know, kind of there are sorry, 22 that, you know, the next display period is fairly limited. So it is this first period that we want to get the the proposals for the record of protected structures put forward rather than the second display period. OK, thank you very much indeed, Helena. I'm just going to finish with one just final question uh, to Roshin, just a short one. Just what's the next steps from here? Uh, what, what happens here now with the development plan process? I suppose, Jerry, it's our hope that everyone here this evening will log on to the website and share their views before the 12th of May. As we've, as we've mentioned previously, this is the first of three opportunities for members of the public to feed into the development plan process. The next stage will be the publication of a draft plan and that won't happen. That won't be published until February of next year. So for now, the strategic issues paper and other information are available on our website and we welcome all your submissions. And I suppose just to state, you know, a submission doesn't need to be a long report. It can simply be your ideas and how the, how the county can be improved. As I outlined earlier, tell us about your community, what works well, what's missing, how we can make Fingal better and developed, well serviced, well connected towns, villages and communities. And we look forward to hearing and reading all your views and comments. So thank you again for coming along this evening. Yes, and uh, that's it. We've run out of time. Uh, if your question hasn't been answered, don't worry. It will be forwarded on to the development plan team and it will be considered as part of the preparations for the draft development plan. Thank you to everybody who did submit questions this evening. Uh, we thank you all for logging in as well. We'll have another webinar next Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. when we will be discussing employment and economy. So I do hope you can join us then. To book a place, just go to fingal.ie forward slash development plan and I look forward to talking to you then. 
Don't forget also that you can make a submission, as Roisin said, to the development plan on, at consult.fingal.ie up until May the 12th. And if you want to watch tonight's webinar again, a recording will be available later this week on the development plan website, along with a recording of our first webinar, which was about people and place. My thanks to Roisin Burke, Christine Baker, Kevin Halpenny and Helena Bergen for joining us this evening and providing us with plenty of food for thought. I do hope that what they had to say will help you in preparing your submission. Until next Tuesday, when we have our next webinar, goodbye and stay safe.